Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Now, the second season of The Mandalorian ends with a spectacular bang. Din Djarin and crew break into Moff Gustavo Fring's secret sketchy operation and were united with a fan favorite. But there's also a moment of extreme awkwardness between Mando Dead and Queen in Exile Bo-Katan concerning a certain Darksaber. Today I want to take a look at this symbol of Mandalorian leadership and explain who's most likely going to wield it in the next few seasons. The Darksaber is pretty legit and probably one of my favorite lightsaber designs. To be honest, I've never really liked lightsabers. They scream, look at me, give me attention, and I think that's a bad idea on the battlefield. I mean, you don't really want to be waving around a glow stick that just attracts blaster bolts. The Darksaber is a lightsaber for people who think lightsabers are stupid. It's black as night, and the only sign of its powerful energy field is a white glimmer that makes up its edge. The Darksaber was forged by Tar Vizsla, one of the first Mandalorians to have Force sensitivity and also join the Jedi Order. This was a huge deal because the Mandalorians and their warlike ways oftentimes found themselves fighting Jedi. In many ways, these two warrior factions were the opposites of one another and therefore made terrific enemies. Tar Vizsla would not only join the Jedi, he would excel at being a Jedi. At one point in his career, Tar Vizsla would return to Mandalore and become the Mandalore, leader of the Mandalorians. Now, when Tar Vizsla passed away, his lightsaber was given back to the Jedi Temple, but then shortly after Clan Vizsla, his family stole it back. While Tar Vizsla was an exceptional Mandalorian hero who was very open-minded and united his family and all of the Mandalorian people together, he was kind of an exception to the rule. The rest of his family was made up of a bunch of degenerates who just wanted power and destruction. And ever since the Darksaber came back into Kalen Vizsla's possession, it kind of became the symbol of leadership. The Vizslas incorporated a rule by strength strategy. Whoever had the Darksaber was the leader of Mandalore, and it could only be taken away from that individual through an honor duel. And so for generations, Mandalorians were led by their best sword fighters, and not necessarily their smartest people, which obviously created a lot of problems for them in the long run. Eventually, the plan would backfire during the Clone Wars. Mandalore pre Vizsla would be challenged to a duel by Maul, a former Sith assassin, and ultimately lose. The Darksaber for the first time would pass to an outsider's possession. It was at this point that pre Vizsla's Death Watch would split into two. He had those who would pledge allegiance to Maul and accept his dominance, and then there was a small faction led by Mandalorian Commander Bo Katan. She refused to accept an outsider's rule. bo was originally a lieutenant of pre Vizsla. One could say that she blindly followed the Vizsla clan and helped implement some of their really dumb ideas. You see, pre Vizsla wanted to rule over Mandalore once again. Decades before the Clone Wars started, Death Watch's more traditional faction had a civil war with the New Mandalorians. This political party believed in reform and later on pacifism once it defeated Death Watch in the Civil War. The Vizslas and Death Watch were driven off of Mandalore after the New Mandalorians won, and they would begin implementing their new policies without even considering Mandalorian culture or tradition. Pre Vizsla ended up making a deal with Maul and a bunch of criminal syndicates. He would hire them to start a false flag attack against Mandalore, at which point Pre Vizsla and his Death Watch would come in and save the day. This plan would work and it would actually get rid of the new Mandalorians and also Duchess Satine Kreis, their leader and sister of Bo Katan. Bo Katan never thought to question any of this and went along with all of this craziness, despite how dishonorable the plan was. Flooding your planet with criminals and thugs and starting a series of events that lead to your sister's death are going to be what's known as a liability when you run for public office. Luckily for Bo-Katan, Mandalorians don't run for public office, they fight each other in sword fights. And that sword by this point was still in Maul's hands. He would eventually leave the sword on Dathomir where it would later be picked up by Sabian Wren, an exile Mandalorian warrior. Now, Sabian Wren technically didn't win the saber from Maul, she just grabbed it while being possessed by Night Sister spirits. Mandalorian protector Fen Ra would try to groom Sabine Wren for leadership, but Sabine Wren wasn't really the leadership type, apparently. The Darksaber would then fall into the hands of Viceroy Gar Saxon, Imperial puppet ruler in charge of Mandalore. He would try to kill Sabine Wren, and in the ensuing duel, she would actually defeat him, officially giving her ownership of the Darksaber. Sabine Wren would try to unite 
the Mandalorian clans against the Empire. It was around this time that Bo-Katan returned to the scene. She technically had been appointed regent of the planet after the Siege of Mandalore at the end of the Clone Wars. Sabian Wren actually offers the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, seeing her as the rightful ruler of Mandalore still. It's a very similar gesture to what we see the Mandalorian do in the last episode. But Bo-Katan refuses to save her because she feels like she's unworthy and she's already lost her chance to rule. But Sabian Wren and Bo-Katan would go on another mission and destroy an Imperial superweapon that targeted specifically Mandalorian armor. After this event, Bo-Katan finally accepted the Darksaber and united several Mandalorian clans and led them straight into the Great Purge, which destroyed a lot of Mandalorian clans and she would lose the Darksaber once again. So as you can see, Bo-Katan never wins the Darksaber, not even once, and although she's definitely a very skilled fighter, her inability to win the Darksaber along with her inability to bring peace and stability to Mandalore makes people doubt her and fills her with some self-doubt as well. Perhaps she thinks she's cursed at this point and will try to avoid uh, being given the Darksaber because it kind of goes against the traditions. bo wants to save her badly, but not for the power it can give her, but for the unification it could bring to her people. She truly is a servant of Mandalore, in my opinion. So Din Djarin's claim to the Darksaber is pretty clear. He disarmed Moff Gideon with his badass spear of Beskar. Up till this point, the only thing Din Djarin seems to care about is the Baby Yoda, though. This is pretty apparent early on when he basically betrays the guild and his client by saving that little guy. His priorities in this case are very clear. Money, power, even tradition comes second to Baby Yoda and his friends. We need more Mando dads in the world. This reluctance to rule puts him in a similar role to Sabian Wren in The Rebels, and once again, Bo-Katan is given the choice to take the saber away from him. Bo-Katan at this point is probably still measuring up this Mandalorian. Notice when the first two meet, well, Bo-Katan's two friends immediately write off uh, him as an extremist and member of the Children of the Watch. Bo-Katan is a little more curious about who he is as an individual. Din Djarin at this point is completely unaware of real Mandalorian culture. He's been raised in this very fundamentalist and extreme school of Mandalorian culture, which is not widely accepted. But we can tell as the seasons progress, he becomes more open-minded as well and casts away some of the more ridiculous beliefs from his culture. Bo-Katan is basically measuring up Din Djarin at this point and seeing if he has what it takes to become the leader. Sometimes a reluctant ruler can be the best ruler. And I think Bo-Katan has matured quite a lot since her last few times as leader of Mandalore, and she's ready to start grooming someone else to take that position because she does have a lot of experience. To make matters even more interesting, if the Darksaber does go to Din Djarin and the Mandalorians don't mind a bit of nepotism, it should be interesting for Baby Yoda to one day get the Darksaber as an inheritance. Just like Tarvisla all those years ago, the Baby Yoda can unite these warrior cultures together under one sword. So there you have it guys, we believe that the Darksaber should stay with Din Djarin. He so far has shown himself to be a very selfless, caring individual who has an extremely strong moral compass despite the fact that he grew up in a cult and that he's surrounded by so many scumbags and mercenaries and bounty hunters. Uh, you know, we definitely vote him for rule and Bo-Katan as an advisor uh, sort of person, she definitely has a lot of knowledge and experience uh, backing her. Anyway, let me know in the comment section below what you guys think. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.